today is week two of a series called Hebrews, The Complete Work of Christ. Uh, we were actually, a few weeks ago, knee-deep in the middle of another series, and I did something fairly rare when we came back from sabbatical. I, I just kind of closed that series down and said, not that, we're going to do this instead. And, and I felt like our church needed to be in the book of Hebrews. And why? Because, listen, there is this thing in all of us called sin, and all sin is is us choosing to do things our own way. But come to find out, when we sin, it causes us to experience separation from God, which leads to shame and rejection and pain. So this book of the Bible, Hebrews, is all about how Jesus Christ is better than every other solution to our shame and our rejection, and that he is more than enough answer to every pain we experience. Don't raise your hand if you've got any pain in your life, but all of us do. This is about hope to anyone here who is struggling with self-doubt. Anybody here that's struggling with self seclusion, this series is about reminding you, or maybe telling you for the first time, it might not be reminding you, about God's love for you, and about the sacrifice Jesus made to bring you back to God. So let's read six verses from Hebrews chapter 3. Verse 1 says this, Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Hands up, hearts open wide as the sky. We lift you high. We lift you high. Hands up, hearts open wide as the sky. Lord, we lift your name high. Let all the other names fade away. Oh, let all the other names fade away. Until there's only you, let all the other names fade away. And Jesus, take your place. And Jesus, take your place. If you feel comfortable doing so, just lift your hands to him around. Come on, say. Hands up, hearts open wide as the sky. We lift you high. We lift you high. Hands up, hearts open wide as the sky. Lord, we lift your name high. Let all the other names fade away. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Let all the other names fade away. Say, until there's only you, let all the other names fade away. Say it one more time. Jesus, take your place. And Jesus, take your let all the other names fade away. Let all the other names fade away. Somebody say, yeah, hey. Let all the other names fade. Say, till there's only you. Until there's only you. Let all the other names fade away. And Jesus, take your place. Jesus, take your place. Come on, are you thankful for the name of Jesus? Amen. Someone is building a brand new house, two houses down from where I live here in Norwalk. It actually started last September or October, maybe earlier than that. And, and when it started, they started building this house. It started really, really fast. They were had the machines out there. They're moving dirt around. And then 
right after that, all of a sudden, the foundation was down, and it seemed like just within days, there were walls going up, and it was going up so fast that I was telling, telling my neighbors, people I'd walk, ran, I talked to random people when I walked by them on the street, right? So I was telling you know what, I think these people, whoever they are, they want to be in their house by Christmas, and I think it's going to happen. I have to walk right by that house when I walk my dog, and every day, something new was happening, something new was in place, and then all of a sudden, Maybe uh, the end of November last year or 1st of December, all of a sudden everything just stopped. I mean, I didn't notice it right when it happened, but maybe it was a couple weeks in that I realized that nothing much had changed for a few days. That pile of dirt that was there is still there. The garage door still wasn't on. There was still no front door on the house. There's no siding going on. So everything started great, but if you were to drive by right now, you'd see that all, not only did they not get in by Christmas, now we're headed toward next Christmas, and they might get in, but the, the house still isn't done. This week, Every time that I walked by the house there with my, my dog Poe, my dog's name is Poe, I kept thinking about this very little innocent sentence that we read last week. I'm going to put it in the screen in just a minute, but I want you to remember this sentence. The author of Hebrews, remember we don't know exactly who it is, but we do knew, know that one big thing the author is up to is letting us know that Jesus is better and Jesus is superior. Does anybody remember that from last week? Amen. Jesus is better and he is superior. These two words appear 15 times in the book, and you, you might ask, well, okay, but better than what and superior to what? And the answer to that question is yes, right? He's got a better plan than all the other plans. He's got better answers than all the other answers, and he speaks a better word than all the other words that have ever been spoken. I'm still remembering uh, the Pastor Mike's message from a couple of weeks ago when he says that Jesus speaks a, a better word over our kids. When our, our, our kids are being called, what, the anxious generation, what is, what is Jesus speaking over them? He's speaking peace over them, right? So we're setting all that up, and we're going to be here for a month in Hebrews. We'll make sure that we get it. But as we're setting up how much better Jesus is than everything else, we came across this little sentence. I'll let you see it on the screen, just the second half of it. It says, after making purification for sins, he, and who is he here? It's Jesus, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. I even said last week that as I read that, in fact, especially as you read verse 1 and verse 2, and you get there, it almost seems casual and nonchalant the way that it is. After making, uh, puri purifying and cleansing the whole world of sin, Jesus just sat down. So I have a question for you this morning. When, when do you sit down? I'll just think about your typical day and all the things that you, you've got to get done. And I know from talking to you how hard all of you work. All of you. Lately, though, I've been marveling at, at single parents again. Sing, single parents are a marvel to me because I've been watching um, our daughter with our, our new grandson, and I, I resisted the temptation to put a picture of my grandson up today. But my daughter and her husband are taking care of little Bo Michael. And listen, you know, when you have a new baby, it's just every minute of every day is activity. You are doing something. And it takes two of them, Sheridan and Sterling, to keep up with Bo. And I can remember just Cynthia and I running breathlessly through our lives, trying to take care of Riley and Reagan and Sheridan, and there are two of us. There are two of them, so I marvel. I pray for all single parents who are doing it many times with just one parent in the house. Special prayers for you, too. But just imagine, single parents, but everybody here, imagine your typical day and all the things you have to do. Let me ask you again, when do you sit down? Now, some of you are going to say, I don't ever sit down. But if you were to sit down, when would it be that you sat down? When you're finished. When you're done, right? So I wanted you to remember that Jesus sat down. That's almost like a review for today, but it's important for what we read here today. In fact, somebody say, Jesus sat down. Now turn to somebody close to you and say, because Jesus finished his work. That's what these kind of six complicated verses that we read have to say. And I'm saying they're complicated because there's just a lot of unfamiliar words and ideas. But first of all, we're directed in verse 1, I have it underlined, to consider Jesus. I want you to leave that verse up there. I was away for eight weeks this summer, and when Jacinta and I got back, 
um, all, I had all of these ideas and visions for the future, but if I had to sum up everything that is in my spirit for our church in this city, in this county, in this state, in this country, I would wrap it all up in those two words. These two words would be good, consider Jesus. I said last week that in a culture that we live in that is, is about all ideas being equally good, right? All paths lead in the same direction. And, you know, you've got your truth and I've got my truth. Right in the middle of all of that, I want to tell you, I am in need of a better word. My heart is in desperate need of a superior truth. I don't need any more second-rate life hicks, hicks, life hacks. A life hick is uh, somebody that does life in there from the country, right? I don't need any more second-rate life hacks from TikTok on how to live a more mindful life, right? Very mindful, right? Very demure, very cutesy, right? No, no, no. I've <laughs> that went better with this crowd over here. <laughs> They're like... No, I, I've lived long enough to know this. I, I, I need a better word. Let me just let you line up all, all of your ideas on how to get ahead in life. And once you're done, I want to join the author of Hebrews in saying this, consider Jesus. And how is Jesus described here? You see his description. He's the apostle and high priest of our confession. Like I said, some difficult words. Watch this. Apostle just means sent from God, and high priest means representing God to people. So Jesus is the one sent from God who represents God to his people. He is the exact imprint of God. So God sent him, and if we want to know what God looks like, we look at Jesus. He is the sent one, and he is the representative of what? Of our confession let's say something about this word confession when we we use when we use the word confession we we're usually talking about what we're usually admitting that we've done something wrong right confession normally means telling someone that you did something that you shouldn't have would you agree that's what we normally mean right confession means owning up what does that look like yes officer i should not have driven that fast Right? Yes, friend, I should not have forgotten that we were supposed to meet for coffee and stood you up. Yes, friend, I should not have become a fan of the New York Giants. But the NFL starts today. But the, but the first Christian, that was, that was cheap. It was just as cheap in the first service, and then I repeated it. Did you forgive me? <laughs> the first Christians who read this letter did not think of this word confession that way. That's not what they thought of. Confession for them, and it should be for us today, this is what this word means for us. It means not owning up to something they did wrong, but owning up to believing the Christian message and belonging to the Christian movement. So when you see that word, that's what that word means. Here's what confession meant to them. It, it's our meaning for today. Yes, I do believe Jesus is God's son sent to rescue me. Yes, I do believe that all of God's promises came true in Jesus. Yes, I do belong to the family that Jesus thinks of as his brothers and sisters, and he's the one sent to people that believe that way, and he is God's representative of the people who believe that way. Let me say it a different way today. We need a revelation of Jesus. And I'm saying that knowing as I look across the room, there are people here today who don't even know exactly how you feel about Jesus. That's okay. The church, you're here at church just kind of checking things out. Maybe you got drug here against your will, and you're, you're just kind of exploring your faith. And I hope that you, we pray all the time and, and prepare that you would feel very welcome here. That's our heart, that you would feel welcome. You can know that this is a place that you can belong before you believe. We've even been saving you a seat. And even though some of you are here just trying to discover, I I want everybody to hear this today we need a revelation of Jesus and the reason is is because I want you to finish well I want you to make it 
I want everyone here to finish well. I want you to make it. So we're admittedly on Jesus' overdose here. He's the one that God has sent. He's God's representative to those who believe. And then verse 2 says, Jesus was faithful to him who appointed him. That makes sense since we already saw that Jesus sat down because he was done. He was faithful to do what he was sent to do. But then look at the end of verse 2. Jesus was faithful to him who appointed him just as Moses also was faithful in all of God's house. Huh? It's kind of a weird throw in there, right? Where did, where did Moses come from all of a sudden? Just in, just in case you don't know, Moses is this guy on the left side of your Bible. He was a man who was very reluctant to do the work of God, which God wanted him to do. But God asked him actually to do something very big, which was to deliver God's people out of slavery in Egypt. So this is hero status Moses. He's a big deal, but it still just catches me off guard when I see it because I'm tracking on Jesus. I'm tracking on Jesus, and then here comes Moses. Now, here's one thing that will help you when you read the Bible. And I don't know if I still have my, my soap guide up here. I think I lost my soap guide, but we have new soap guides available. I don't need it. It's fine. We have new soap guides that are available. They came out last week. It's how we read the Bible together. Get that. We got some new features in there to make it easier for you to kind of, listen, get in God's Word. It's how we read the Bible uh, uh, together. But here's, here's a, one thing that will help you when you read the Bible. If something, when you're reading the Bible, seems off, it's not because something is off. All right? So let me say it a different way. If someone, something when you're reading the Bible catches you off guard when you're reading, there's a reason for it, and this is supposed to catch you off guard. Because it sounds like this. If you read the chapter, Jesus, 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 Moses. That's how it's supposed to make you feel. Now catch it. Let me, let, let me just teach you for a minute, and then I think you'll see why we have the great Moses interruption here. So, Somebody say, Moses isn't an accident. It's the weirdest thing I've ever had you say. I like that. That's officially the weirdest thing. No, Moses isn't an accident here. Remember, this book is about better things, a better word, superior ideas, superior solution. Here's what's going on. The first people who ever read this letter of Hebrews were Jewish Christians. And now that Jesus has come, they're actually kind of stuck between two equal but opposite solutions. Or maybe you could say they had two pressures that they were dealing with because their tradition very clearly said that God had given Moses his law by the way, if this is all new to you, just believe me now. Check it out later. You can Google it. It's all there, right? God had given Moses his law. That law was binding on God's people for all time. That's the law that you follow for all of your life for thousands of years, y'all. That's the law. You got to feel this. God's law was unalterable, inflexible, unchanging, uncompromising. That's just how it was. And now here comes Jesus. So if that's the way I feel about things, then the best thing that I can say about Jesus is, oh, Jesus is just coming, bringing some fresh new insights to the law of God. You know, good for Jesus. So Moses, in this pressure, is like the senior partner, and it's the law that's going to continue to shape who we are and how we live and everything we've ever believed about how God is going to come and save us and move us into a new age. That's still out there. The new age is still to come. Jesus is just going to help us get there. That's one pressure. Feel that. But then some of these early Christians were starting to get really excited, just like there's some people in this room as you're considering Jesus, who are starting to get really excited. And over here, this pressure was saying, you know, no, no, I think that everything God said was going to happen in the new age is here right now. The, these people over here, this pressure, they wanted to move as fast as they could in the opposite direction from the law. These people were like, no, 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 we're Jesus people now. We don't have anything to good to say about Moses anymore. We don't have anything good to say about the law. We don't even have anything good to say about Israel. This is the other pressure. A, a long time ago, people used to disagree at church, right? It doesn't happen anymore, but it it used to happen a long time ago. The author here doesn't want to give in to either of those pressures. He's going to say that Jesus is faithful, just like Moses is faithful, and there's a but coming. Everybody get this. Moses matters, but Jesus matters more. Verse 3, for Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. 
Now, we've already had clues that Jesus is better. Remember, Jesus, in a previous verse, we don't need to go back to it, was called the high priest. Just so you know, Moses was never called a high priest. The high priest, Pastor Jacinta read it earlier in our worship, the high priest was the mediator between God and his people. And even though Moses did some priestly things, when he set up his tabernacle in the wilderness to worship God, he was not the high priest. Moses needed a high priest, but Jesus is the high priest. Did everybody get that? So we already saw that, but what I want you to see is another pressure because it's a pressure that everyone in this room still lives with right now. Two opposite solutions on how to navigate life. Moses brought the law. Jesus brought grace. I want you to write this down wherever you're taking notes. Because of Jesus' finished work, believers can rest under grace rather than the law. What was the law of Moses? This is important. First of all, the law of Moses was beautiful. It was healthy. It was given by God. And the law, as we look at it, it's the left side of your Bible, especially the first five books, is not something to point at, something to ridicule, not something to be bitter at. The law was given to man so that man could flourish. What's the law of Moses? First five books of the Old Testament, it's the Pentateuch, uh, sometimes known as the Torah. You're going to find there 613 commandments, a comprehensive list of rules and regulations, and these were not given to God's people to crimp their style or to try to ruin their life, but to help them live flourishing lives in relationship with God. But all you have to do is read through the left side of your Bible to find out that as beautiful as the law was, the people fell short. The Old Testament is this this narrative of this inevitable ebb and flow of people trying to live right and do the right thing and constantly falling short. And by the way, did they fall short because the law was faulty? No. Why did they fall short? Because they were faulty. They, 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 They fell because they had fallen. As the old commercial says, they had fallen and they can't get up. I've fallen, I can't. Listen, all you have to do is look at your own life. Some of you are, I look at your discipline and I am blown away. I look at your work ethic, I am blown away. I look at how you take care of your family, blown away. But I want you to hear this, no matter how hard you work, no matter how disciplined you are, no matter how carefully you manage your life, at some point you come to the end of yourself. You come to the end of your ability to keep doing the right thing every time. That's the law of Moses. So then what is the grace of Jesus? It's the heart of the gospel. It's the good news. Grace says this, that we were separated from God because of sin. That separation caused us to feel guilty and empty. It actually caused us to fear death. The grace of God says that because of his love for us, God sent Jesus to die in place of people, bridging the gap. It's what Pastor Jacinta read earlier, between God and people. The grace of God is Jesus' sacrifice. Grace was that Jesus lived a sin-free life and died on the cross to pay for people's sins. Grace is about Jesus' resurrection. Amen. You can give God praise for that. Amen. Grace is about Jesus' resurrection because Jesus defeated death and rose again to life. I hope that what I want you to make sure you see is the contrast between the law and grace. Grace, which is about understanding that now people can ask God for forgiveness and listen, stop trusting in themselves. Yeah. I like this person back here who claps. That's, that's my favorite guy. We're going to lunch sometime, all right? Did you get this? Grace allows you to stop trusting in yourself. In fact, grace demands it. And grace is about God's design. I just want you to know about the grace of Jesus. We can begin to understand God's original design for our lives because of God's grace in Jesus. And, and by the way, here it may sound like I'm just talking to people who have never met Jesus and never made a decision to follow him. I'm not doing that. I'm talking not just to people who have never made a decision to follow Jesus. The pressure between the law and grace continues even after we come to know Jesus as Lord. I love the way, I love the way Tim Keller said it. I don't have it on the screen. I just want you to hear this quote from Tim Keller. He says, quote, 
Your computer operates automatically in a default mode unless you deliberately tell it to do something else. So, Luther says that even after you are converted by the gospel, your heart will go back to operating on other principles unless you deliberately, repeatedly set it to gospel mode. Since it's not on the screen, nobody asked for it. I'm reading it again. Your computer operates automatically in a default mode unless you deliberately tell it to do something else. So Martin Luther, he's quoting Luther, says that even after you are converted by the gospel, hear this, your heart will go back to operating on other principles unless you, what, deliberately, repeatedly set it to gospel mode. In other words, unless we constantly remind ourselves that our salvation is because of God's grace and God's grace alone, we might start to mistakenly think that our salvation has something to do with our religious accomplishments. Man, I'm preaching today, but somebody better get this, all right? Listen to me, if you've been around long enough to start thinking that you have something to do with being right with God, start over. Amen. Come back to the beginning. Come back to the start. It's God's grace that has saved you. And, and at this point, there's some people in this room, I know that you're struggling, I can feel it in the atmosphere, because you still have this sense that, you know what, you know, Pastor Kevin, I hear you, but I'm, I'm a pretty good person anyway. I'm not perfect, of course, nobody's perfect, but I do good enough often enough. It's exactly when we start measuring ourselves in relation to God that we miss out on the grace of God. Write this down. Being a good person won't save us. Only God's grace offers us forgiveness. Here's what God knew. We didn't need any more rules. We needed forgiveness. And I've got to tell you, that's where I am. I need God's forgiveness. Very recently I was in a public scenario where some speeches were being made and after the scheduled speeches were made, someone else stood, to, stood up to speak. They were not scheduled to speak. And from the very first word that they started speaking, I could just tell, this isn't going to go well. And it didn't. The other speeches were on point, and this one really wasn't. So much so that it became a little uncomfortable in the room. And I'll be honest to admit, I may not have been very gracious in that moment as I sat there. I'll go further than that. I wasn't. But later... When I was driving back to the hotel, God reminded me that I also come up short. He reminded me that I also don't have my act together, that I also mess up a lot. I also say and do the wrong thing at the wrong time in the wrong place. I'm also someone that's in need of God's mercy. Reminds me of a story I heard from Pastor Tony Evans. He said this, Quote, a guy had his picture taken. He was very upset with the photographer and very upset with the picture the photographer had taken. So he rushed back into the photographer and said, look at this picture of me. This picture does not do me justice. The photographer looked at him and said, mister, with a face like yours, you don't need justice. You need mercy. That's good. Somebody tweet that. That's good. Did you know this is the reason why our world is in so much trouble. I'm just going to let you off the hook for a minute so we can think about the big world before we think about ourselves again. Why though the world is crying out for justice. Justice for everything. Justice for everyone. But this is exactly the situation that we're in. We don't need justice. We need a whole lot of mercy. I want you to know this. If I get justice, I'm not going to like what I get old song by this group called the Newsboys said, when we don't get what we deserve, it's a real good thing. The second verse says, when we get what we don't deserve, it's a real good thing. Why is Jesus superior to Moses? Because grace is superior to the law. Look one more time. I'm going to read these verses three through six again. Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built up by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now, Moses was faithful, hear this, in all of God's house as a servant. Everybody say servant. To testify to the things that were spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. Somebody say son. 
And we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. Leave verse 6 up there if you would. Moses was a true servant of God, but Jesus is God's son. Moses worked as a servant in God's house, but guess what? Jesus owns the house. And what is God's house? Do you know who God's house is? God's house is God's people. Listen to me. You are God's house. Amen? I love verse 6. I love how it ends. It says we're going to hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. The people in God's house, get this, are a bold and confident family. I hope that's how you feel on small group Sundays. We get ready to spend time together every week for the next 12 or weeks or so. I hope that's how we feel as we gather in here every single week. I hope that we can do better than all of the wishy-washy language I hear spoke about the house of God, especially in our country. Well, you know, I've decided to follow Jesus. That's what I decided, but, but I know everybody else has their own way. No, no, no. Either you believe that God's new world has arrived in Jesus, and it's right here, right now, waiting for us, which makes us bold and, and live in our living and acting like we believe that and that we can make confident claims based on our belief or you haven't really understood what Christianity is all about this isn't about arrogance it's about celebrating because you know the hope of the gospel it's not about arrogance because you know it doesn't have anything to do with your accomplishments and it's got everything to do with God's love and God's grace let's pray together all over this room, if you just close your eyes where you are. It's a holy moment after we receive God's word. God, we're so thankful for your word. Lord, your word is like a sword that, that pierces and it divides, it cuts things off. It puts us in a better place than we were before. God, your, your word is, is healing to us. It's life to us. Your word is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. So thank you for your word that you've spoken to us today. I pray, Jesus, for people in this place that I was, I was talking about trusting in themselves. They can identify with that. They can identify with actually working so hard and struggling so hard to get everything right and still sometimes feeling or many times feeling like they come up short. In Jesus' name, Lord, I, I pray that they would feel your love for them in this place they would accept your invitation that you made to all of us when you said, come, come to me, all of you that are weighed down, all of you that are tired, all of you that are struggling under the burden of life, you said, I will give you rest. Take on a new way of life. Take on a new burden. Take on a new way of living. Lord, I pray for people here who have been followers of you for a long time and are still struggling with this pressure between law and grace, Lord, help us to become convinced that there's nothing that we could do to save ourselves. If we could have done it, we, we tried hard enough. Many of us have tried hard enough and done enough. Many of us have just would say, I haven't even done well at all. But Lord, you have grace for all of us in this place today, that you are standing here right now with your arms open wide to even people who have decided to follow you before, say, still come to me, still come to me, and I will give you rest. Still lay your, 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 your other yoke down and take on a new yoke, take on a new burden, because I will give you rest. I want to pray for some people in this room that maybe have never made a decision to follow Jesus. Maybe as you drove in the parking lot today, maybe even before you came, you just felt God was speaking to you. Maybe as we were singing, maybe as I was speaking today, you just you felt this, this in your heart to, to step out and to make a new decision. And, and that maybe you've never made the decision to follow Jesus with your whole life. If that's you today, I, I want to give you an opportunity to pray a prayer, repeat some words after me, and it's not the words that will save you, it's your faith in Christ that saves you. But if there's somebody here today that would like to just put a line in the sand and say that today is the day that I, I made a decision to follow Jesus and that I, I made a decision to surrender, that I made a decision to make him the ruler and the king and the Lord of my life. 
with all the heads bowed, all the eyes are closed, nobody's looking around. I'd, I'd love to lead you in a prayer. Would you just let me know who I'm leading in a prayer today? I'd love to know who I'm leading in a prayer just by you lifting up your hand where you are. Lift up your hand wherever you are today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You can put your hands down. Broad River Church, let's pray together with those who lifted their hands. If you just repeat after me, say, Lord Jesus, thank you for rescuing me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for your resurrection and the new life that I have in you. Now I give you my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I want to follow you all of my days. I love you, Jesus. In Jesus' name. Amen.